So let's talk about some, some uh, epidemiology, if you will. How common are C. diff infections in the United States, or worldwide? So C. diff infections are relatively common. Um, it's interesting, though, I was just uh, at another meeting, and, and uh, the presenter said C. diff is rare. And I challenged her and said, "That's why are we talking about it then?" Yeah. And her point was, it's rare from an FDA definition perspective, so that it qualifies for special consideration at the FDA. So that's a bureaucratic rare, right? Not a clinician's rare. Correct. For clinicians, especially hospitalized, hospital-based clinicians, C. diff is all too common. So, is it getting more common, less common, and what's this NAP one strain anyway? So the change in epidemiology is interesting. Uh, through the 1990s and early 2000s, there was a significant rise in the United States. And since about 2010 or so, it, it's plateaued. Okay. But still, it plateaued at a high rate. So it's not good to be at a plateau if the plateau is at 20,000 feet, I guess. So the estimate is about 500,000 cases in the U.S. per year. Well, that's not rare. Where I come from, that's a lot. You think? Right. And C. diff actually is the number one healthcare facility associated infectious okay. organism today, displacing Staph aureus and displacing methasone resistant staph. So okay. this is new. I mean, th this is something that has occurred progressively for the last 15 years okay. or so. And this NAP1 strain you mentioned is really critical in terms of driving that increase in rates in especially healthcare institutions. It's not as prevalent in the community, uh, but in healthcare infections, it has really driven that outbreak. However, it's on the decline now, which is the good news. So we've gone from hospitals that have 30 to 50% NAP1 strains in their hospital, where today that's probably closer to 20%. Is NAP1 more virulent, or is it simply a different strain? Uh, both. It, uh, it is more virulent, I believe, although there's, there's some question about that in the literature, but uh, we find that these uh, patients who have NAP1 have a higher proportion of them that have really severe disease and fulminant okay. disease, but you can have NAP1 asymptomatically, you can have it with mild disease uh, expression, or you can have extremely severe disease. It, it covers the spectrum, and, and I think that's important to remember because not everyone with NAP1 is going to be deathly ill. Uh, it's, a, it's a complete spectrum. But it has a third toxin, this binary toxin, that probably is an important uh, pathogenesis factor. All right, so let's get into it. I think it's yeah. important to remember that um, um, what has changed with C. diff is not just the frequency, but the severity. So many will argue that C. diff in the past 20 years is, is somewhat a different disease from what it used to be. How so? So not only that we have strains that are more infectious, but also strains, as you heard, that are more likely to make the person very sick. Okay. And so, and I think that this uh, increased severity of illness has contributed to the, um, to the, um, to the increased um, um, appreciation about C. diff being a major uh, healthcare uh, pathogen. Since you bring that up, let's go right to the morbidity and mortality. How big a problem is this from the perspective of people being sick for a long time and, and or dying? Well, uh, if you use the, so I think when, what's important when you discuss epidemiology, it's important to remember that unlike tuberculosis and other infections that have been reportable for a very long period of time, C. diff only became reportable just a couple of years ago. And, and so the epidemiology, I think we just start to understand the epidemiology, and I think there was a lot of underappreciation to how, how common C. diff is. If you look at the CDC website, when the CDC was still citing about 400,000 uh, annual cases, and this was a few years ago, the CDC also said that about 30,000 people die within a month of being, if I'm correct with the numbers, within a month of being diagnosed with C. diff. And it's not necessarily because their C. diff was out of control, but as you know, you get C. diff, you're older, you have comorbidities, your comorbidities exacerbate, and you end up dying or getting readmitted to the hospital mm -hmm. and so forth. So I think it's the consequences are not just how common it is, but how commonly it exacerbates your comorbidities. And with the host becoming older nowadays and having more comorbidities, the consequences of C. diff are worse as well. Okay, so the people at highest risk, let's put this on the table quickly. Uh, is it just everybody who's had antibiotics, or who's at highest risk? Uh, highest risk are older patients in the hospital for long periods of time on antibiotics. Okay, those are all the bullet points. Is it more likely, if you've had one C. diff infection, that you're going to have another one? Does that put you at high risk? It certainly does. 
Okay. okay, so we'll add that to the bullet points. Antibiotics, older, hospitalized, previous C. diff. What about C. diff in the household? Somebody else in your household has had C. diff. Yeah, so they're actually an interesting study. So this concept of community-acquired C. diff, changing the way we think about the infection. We used to think of it as an inpatient infection in older patients, et cetera. We've now, multiple studies have shown a significant proportion of C. diff <clears throat> occurs in outpatients, some of which had hospital exposure. And there was a study looking at the infection rate in household dwellers of patients discharged with a diagnosis of C. diff compared to those discharged from the same hospital without C. diff. And the attack rate was something like 70-fold higher in spouses Got it. if their spouse had been discharged with a diagnosis of C. diff. I have right. an interesting uh, ex example of this. I was just involved in a case in which a person received clindamycin for a uh, odontogenic, for a tooth abscess from a dentist. And, um, and about a week and a half later, developed C. diff that was so bad that he had to be admitted to the hospital and had to under, undergo uh, total colectomy, okay. the removal of in, his entire, and what was interesting is that his wife worked in a skilled nursing home. Uh, and although she was not sick, I always thought that she was the source for C. diff and she may be carrying C. diff. Okay, I don't want to throw any brickbats around here, but when I was a young house officer, pterodactyls flew through the sky, clindamycin. That was the first thing that we talked about, and we, we didn't even call it C. diff, right? It was pseudomembranous colitis. Is it still a big offender? Is clindamycin still the, the drug to avoid, or is it everything now? Well, clindamycin is the highest risk drug, I, I still believe. However, the use of clindamycin has declined markedly from when it was first marketed. Okay. Although it remains a very um, effective drug for treating methicillin resistance mm -hmm. to aureus in the community setting. So it's, it has considerable outpatient use, and quoting uh, Johan, Oral uh, surgeons and dentists use it frequently for dental abscesses. I got it. But you know, I, I remember this line from a movie, be afraid, I'm very afraid. Right. That's, that's a, an offender, yeah. if you will. I think the dentists are getting that message. I th think they're using it less than they used to. But in addition to, to clindamycin, drugs like fluoroquinolones, which are mm -hmm. used very commonly, used to be thought of as a low-risk antibiotic, are now recognized as high-risk class of antibiotics. But everybody takes a z -pack. Um I guess maybe I'm, fewer should. I have to tell you about an anecdote. My Please wife went do. to the dentist. She had a dental abscess. She comes home with a prescription for clindamycin plus Floristor, <laughs> a probiotic to take with it. And I looked at that and I said, you're not going to take that. <laughs> <laughs> and I wrote her a prescription All right, for ampicillin and she, she took that. I mean, it's a, still a risk, but it's a much lower risk drug.